Go ahead. Thank you. So, I'm Olivia Waite. I'm a research associate in the Integrated Remote Sensing Studio at UBC under the supervision of Dr. Nicholas Koops and work closely in this project with Samuel Grubinger as well as the Canadian Forest Services. So, Miriam Isaac Renton, Jake King, and as Alex Liu. And we're going to take a little bit of a shift from the genetic side, just looked at phenotyping and specifically using drone mounted sensors with Douglas fir in progeny trials. So a little background. As I'm sure we're all aware, our climate is changing much faster than Douglas fir can naturally adapt or migrate, which has led to an increased observation of drought induced mortality, as well as extended growing seasons, increasing the risk of frost damage. So though there are currently phenotypic data taken from many, many progeny trials to try to scan for environmental resilience or resistance and adaptive traits, the phenotypic data often collected is not only costly but time inefficient and can sometimes harm the tree, which can affect the study. For example, looking at drought response in tree cores. So our aim of this project is to try to operationalize remote sensing tools to try to be able to scan many more progeny trials as well on a much faster or shorter interval time scales and at a much lower cost to try to scan for um, multiple traits. So for example, looking for volume and drought resilience now. And we do this, as I mentioned, with drones. So any, anyone who's interested in the specifics, I'm going to quickly go through the drone we use and the sensors, and then I'll get into the kind of data we're actually able to see from each one. So we use the Matrice 300 RTK. And to look at our structural data changes, we use the L1, which is our LiDAR sensor. If you're also interested in just RGB imagery, this sensor's great because it also has an RGB camera. To look at our physiological changes, we use a multispectral camera, the MicroSense Red Edge dual camera system. And I'll go in each, into detail in each of these a bit later. And lastly, we are trying to look at water balance changes which, with an H20T, which is our thermal sensor. So a little background into the actual sites involved in this project. We started off with four main sites. There's half of which are um, Western Red Cedar, half of which are Coastal Douglas Fir. And we added two more because there's a piece of this project that's also going to validate our remote sensing data with pigment data. Um, it's not ready yet for this presentation, so we won't see any, but hopefully next year. And specifically for this presentation, just because there's so much data, we're only going to look at this younger coastal Douglas fir site, Western 45, which is on the southwest tip of Vancouver Island down there. So at each of these six sites you just saw, we've been going out bi-weekly starting May to October. And every time we go out, so at each of these red lines, we fly our mic sense, which is the multi-spectral camera, and the H20T, which is our thermal camera. We did our best to go once a month throughout the winter. However, because of snow, rain, fog, we were not always able um, to actually capture the data. And then again, we started up again, um, going bi-weekly in April of this year. And this temperature data, we also have climate loggers at our Jordan River site and then as well as at our Powell River site on the mainland. And the purpose of this, um, of the interval that we've been flying is just to try to really capture the response to any different heat changing as well as, well as um, water content and the different environmental variables that we're looking for. We also took two different structural um, data acquisitions with the L1 sensor I mentioned, one in June of 22 2022 and one in um, either December or January, depending on the site. So now I'm going to give you a look at the different kind of data that we're actually able to collect with each of these sensors. So firstly, we have the L1, which is our structural data. So here we're looking at collecting similar phenotypic data that you would normally collect, so for example, height. But also now, because we have a 3D point cloud, we're able to look at new phenotypic data, for example, crown volume. And we do this with a pretty high point density. I'm, for each of these sensors, I'm not going to go into specific flight parameters. But if anyone's interested, I love talking flight parameters. And I'll gladly talk with you after, or if you have any questions. And I'll just point out that 
some of these sensors do have a constraint of when you can fly them. This, because it, if it's just structural, this is not one of them, but if you do want to use that RGB um, imagery, you're going to want to be in the bounds of solar noon to just minimize shadowing. But back to the structural side. So, for example, on this figure here, the L1, that x-axis, is the heights measured from this sensor, and the y-axis is the infield measurements. Um, for the most part, it does a pretty good job. Something to take note of is this is a five-year-old site, so there's going to be a lot of variability just because the L1 might sometimes miss your leader, and that leader for very young sites, if your tree is only three to four meters tall, it's a very large proportion of your tree, but as your trees become 15, 20 meters tall, um, that error um, becomes much, much smaller. And this is kind of what I was, a fancy way of showing that yes, we can measure um, crown volume for each of the trees as well. And this is an example of what your point cloud will look like at an individual tree level from this sensor. Next, we have our microsense. This is, this is the multi-spectral camera. There's 10 very specific bands on this camera, originally designed for agriculture and now used often in forestry to look at different stress responses in plants. The goal of this sensor is to calculate different indices that can be synonymous with different stress responses um, to look for a spectral response to drought and different cold events. When I speak about orthomosaics, just for anyone in the room not familiar, an orthomosaic essentially is, as your drone goes along and takes all these images, they then come back and you stitch them together. You create one large image that um, you're actually able to ex then extract a 3D point cloud from, which is called digital aerial photogrammetry. And we'll talk really quickly about that at the end. Um, and this sensor does fall within this constraint of plus or minus two hours from solar noon just because if possible, you really do want to avoid shadowed pixels when you're calculating these indices. So this is an example of the kind of data that you can see um, from these sensors. So at the top, this is an individual Douglas fir crown, just a snippet from May, June, July, and August. And this is the chlorophyll carotenoid index, which is a remotely sensed index that is a proxy for your chlorophyll carotenoid pigment ratio. So as you can see in May, the areas that are more green are areas with um, more photosynthetic activity, just more um, photosynthetic pigments, and the more orange areas are either there's no photosynthetic material or it's photoprotective pigments. So we see that in May, in June and July, we do see a green up as, as we would expect. There's more growth, photosynthetic activity happening, and then a little bit of a green down starting in August which could be a response to just a summer full of very minimal precipitation or the onset of cold hardening. So I wanted to show that just so you could see the actual resolution that you're able to get data from these sensors at within an individual crown. And at the bottom here is eight random families, just for sake of not overcrowding this graph, um, PCI values over the course of May, um, well, June to the next year's June. And as we can see, we have our increase as from here to here, just down here, um, that you'd expect during the growing season, and then a relatively stable um, CCI value throughout the winter, and then it starts to spike again as the trees begin to increase in their photosynthetic activity again during the next year. And this site is more of, it's the exact same plot you just saw on the other um, slide, but simple down simplified down to just four families to specifically look at what we can now see at the family level. So if we look at first family 87, and sorry, I'm gonna quickly explain this. So these are our CCI blot values plus the population means, just so that we can actually see the real CCI value that we're talking about, whereas the bottom, I just have the blots plotted so you can better see the differences between each of the family. Um, so as you can see, for family 87, it's relatively consistently high compared to the other families, which could indicate a higher productivity, so that higher chlorophyll to carotenoids um, throughout the winter, especially. Family 83 is also consistently high. However, it does seem to have um, a different response than family 87 when it comes to that either onset of cold hardening or response to the end of summer drought. And these are things that it would be up to um, 
people involved in selecting the next trees um, for future trials, whether or not you want this um, earlier onset or earlier, sorry, whether or not you want, yeah, the ratio of your chlorophyll's carotenoids to be a little lower earlier on um, in the cold hardening process. And then, oops, sorry. Perfect. Family 61, there's this very early May spike, which could indicate, it's one of the only positive ones up here. It could indicate that um, there's initially a, an earlier start to the growth season. However, it does stay relatively low compared to other families throughout. So relatively less photosynthetic activity occurring, which is exactly what's happening then in family 14. So this is just an interesting way that we can actually see differences at the family level with just kind of drone level um, phenotypic data. And lastly is our thermal camera. So this is the H20T and the goal of this sensor was to look at any water balance changes, specifically with the knowledge that under different drought stresses, well, canopy temperature increases as transpiration decreases. This sensor specifically looks around 800 to 1400 nanometers. That's the range in the near infrared. And it also has an RGB camera, if that's something that is of interest for your project. But something that's very important is it should be flown also within these bounds of solar noon. Because if you do have extensive shadowing, especially for a while, you're gonna cool off areas of your tree that aren't necessarily cooler because of any process aside from shadowing. And before I present this data, I just wanna preface that this sensor is our most novel sensor in this project. No one, whereas the MicroSense and the L1 are more solidified in the field of forestry, this sensor is, um, we're just trying to see what we can get out of it and there is a lot of validation that's gonna be needed to confirm what we're seeing is actually what we're seeing. But there has been studies that are showing that tops of trees are often um, the more photosynthetically active, which is interesting because we are seeing kind of what our hypothesis was that we would have cooler areas at the tops of the trees and warmer near the bottoms of the trees, um, which is what we're seeing in these two temperature graphs here, which are these two trees that are um, neighboring and these two temperature, um, th these are from the same temperature ortho mosaic, sorry, so taken at the exact same time. And though remote sensing is amazing, I wanna end it on this small note, just because sometimes there are questions of can we use this on our sites? And I wanna end with the necessity of brushing. So if we can't see, so up here there's a lot of crowding and it's hard to distinguish which tree is which tree as well as you can have branch overlap. So if the tree can either not be seen from an aerial view or there's a lot of branching overlap, then you're either gonna get mixed data or no data. And in the case of branch overlap, which we do have in some of our older sites, it's a case where there's a lot of manual editing of the delineated crowns to make sure that we're actually not taking that into account. So on younger sites like this, it's very beautiful, but this is kind of a perfect remote sensing site to work with and is not always the case. Um, also, I wanna quickly touch on ladder versus DAP. So we're using ladder for structure just because we do have some of those older sites, but in a site like this where you can see the ground and they're a little younger, DAP might be the better way to go because um, it's generally, it generally has much less noise than your ladder point cloud. And for anyone interested, I can go into that more in depth with you later. Samuel Grubinger also is using DAP um, in his experiments, which he'll talk about on Thursday. So I recommend going to see that. But that's all for me. We do have a website for this project. It's forestfino.ca if you're interested in following along. Yeah. Th thanks so much. Are there questions? Brian. Yeah, I'm, uh, you, I think I, one of your slides you said you like to use this for like vegetative bud flush. And so I'm wondering about that um, family 61 that had that peak in Maine. Does that correlate with an early flushing family or? I mean, there's a lot that could be going on. So you're talking about this one here. So it's not necessarily 
a huge peak. This is the difference between the families, but the actual value is um, right here. So the chlorophyll carotenoid index more shows, um, because bud flush, sometimes the buds do have a lot of photoprotective pigments in it, a spike in buds wouldn't necessarily be a spike in the chlorophyll carotenoid index, but it could be that the buds have flushed earlier than others and now there is this spike in photosynthetic activity after the fact, right? Um, so it's hard to say for certain since we don't have any on the ground data, but I would assume that is what happened in this family. It just flushed a little earlier. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I have a question, uh, a technical question. Uh, how many memory you need to store your data from one hectare of observation yeah. from w one time? And uh, another question is, uh, how much time uh, take the processing of the data, uh, also for w one hectare? And uh, uh, the, the last question is, uh, do you have a problem with overlap, overlapping the pictures when the trees, uh, uh, tree crowns are very close and uh, trees not, uh, and trees are young? Sorry, what was the last one? Uh, the trees uh, yeah. uh, young and tree, cro uh, tree crowns uh, are close to each other. Okay, so the first question, very dependent on your sensors. The MicaSense, because every photo has 10 bands, so it almost has 10 photos for each one. That one's definitely our um, data storage heaviest sensor. For one flight, that's about a hectare, it would probably end up being around 30 gigabytes. Um, for the H20T, much less, and for the LiDAR, I would say H20T and LiDAR are both maybe around 10. Um, in terms of processing power, very similar story. Because the MicaSense is 10 bands, we use a process called, or um, a tool, I guess it's a whole software, called Agisoft Metashape. And that can be on the order, it can be usually a few days, maybe a week, to get from raw data to ortho mosaic, whereas the thermal, maybe a day and a half, just because there's less bands we're working with. And LiDAR, you just have to run it through DJI Terra to actually get your last file that you can work with. And from there, it depends if you wanna, what you wanna do with that cloud, but that process is relatively quickly. Um, the, the overlap, the overlapping crowns. Oh, the overlapping crowns? For making the ortho mosaic? Yeah. Sorry, uh, thank you. When you do the uh, point say for, for all territory, uh, you need to overlap the photos, yes? Yeah. And uh, is there some problems with it? Oh yeah. A great question, actually. So whenever you fly and you want to make an ortho mosaic with just imagery, you have to make sure that you're either flying at an over, the rule is over 85%. I usually don't fly under 88% because I'm terrified of going to the, back to the lab and things don't overlap. Um, but yeah, generally the rule of thumb is around over 85 to actually make sure they align. That becomes kind of tricky with the L1 if that's your one sensor and you want structure but you also want to make some indices with your RGB you kind of have to play a game between getting high enough overlap to align your RGB, but maybe sacrificing some accuracy in your L1 point cloud, because if there's any wind and you fly at a really high overlap, you're gonna catch the top of your trees multiple times. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank. Yep, sorry. Are we, are we, no. We can Let, talk after. Yeah, let's, sorry, sorry about you. Okay, let's, um, Let's uh, have it. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. Um.